All right, so we get to talk about now proper electrochemistry. We're going to start by defining the potential. Uh, by definition, the potential is the work used to move a charged particle from one point to another within an electric field. And formally, the potential has uh, the, fi the following equation. The amount of work, the change in work associated with moving the particle in the electric field. And this depends on the charge, right? So you're actually dealing with work per charge as the value of the potential. And so the units typically go with potential are joules per coulomb, right? Joules per energy and coulomb per the charge that you have present in there. And the joule per coulomb, we actually call it um, a specific thing. We call it the volt. But the thing I want to point out here is that because you're looking at the ratio of energy per charge, this is going to be a constant no matter how big a sample you have or how small a sample you have because the charge will also change proportionally with the amount. And so the energy, which also changes, is going to be averaged out by the change in the charge itself. So the potential, which will be given in volts, is technically a constant no matter what amount you're dealing with. And that's going to have some consequences when we start looking at equations and uh, combining equations together. Now the naught represents the fact that the potential is at its standard state, which means that the temperature is at 298 Kelvin. If you do have any concentrations, the concentrations are expected to be one molar. And if you have any gases, the gases are expected to be at one atmosphere pressure. All right, so for instance, when you have protons in your balanced equation, uh, the protons will be expected to be at one molar in the standard state, which means that the pH will be zero. Typically, we don't have solutions at pH of zero, so the standard state may not necessarily you know, represent the picture that we are um, observing in terms of our reaction setup. So we might need to change it, and we'll get to that uh, later in the lecture. First, let's talk about um, how you set up electrochemistry experiments. The typical apparatuses, some of them actually could be a little bit more intricate than others, uh, but technically speaking, the way you do this is you have two cells, one that contains one reactant, the other cell that contains a different reactant, but they are separate from each other. They don't actually interact with each other, and you allow the reaction to proceed by exchanging electrons through the wires, thus producing electricity. So um, typical experiments use um, uh, electrodes, like the ones that I'm showing here. Some of them are made out of gold, some of them are made out of platinum, some of them are made out of carbon. Uh, some of them are actually little strips, as you can see right here, rather convenient. And then you have your potential stat that provides all of the electrical potential to carry out your experiments. So your typical electrochemistry experiments uh, revolve around three individual electrodes. You have a counter electrode and a working electrode, which basically give you um, the flow of electricity within your cell. And then you have a reference electrode that you use to basically calibrate the values that you're getting here and come up with values that um, can be correlated to each other. And so in your typical experiment, this is known as the cyclic voltammogram, you get these little humps, which kind of look like little, little ducks, right? And you can do experiments uh, which can show you by varying the current at which you apply the the electricity to your setup, you can see what happens to the little duck shape. And generally speaking, if this is a reversible process, one way you can oxidize and reduce the species without it undergoing decomposition, what you see is this over, you know, elongation of the of the upper curve and the bottom curve of the of the little ducky. Right, so yeah, I mean, they remind me of ducky, so you can kind of see the shape. It's like, yeah, it's definitely a little ducky. <laughs> um, but okay, what basically this means is that the experiments that get done for you to determine the electrical potential, which by the way happened right at the average value of the upper portion and lower portion of this diagram, uh, they get associated with each one of the boundaries that you see here in the potential diagram. So, for instance, looking at the iron 3 to iron 2 reduction couple. That specific reduction uh, happens by, you know, lowering the potential, going at more negative potentials, 
and that's technically what we call the cathode, the reduction. Uh, going in the opposite end, going from the 2 plus to the 3 plus, where the oxidation takes place, we call that the anode. And I'll depict a diagram later on that explains very clearly why the reduction is called the cathode and why the oxidation is called the anode. But um, the idea is that you're doing that whole reduction and oxidation cycle by going through this cyclic voltammogram. So technically speaking, the value, right? So you have your cathodes on one end, you have your anode on the other. Uh, technically speaking, the average of those peaks, right? The intermediate value is what we refer to as the electrode potential. Um, and that's what gets reported right here. So this particular mid value is the 0.77 volts, right? So you'll have a value of 1.7 for one of the peaks, 0.84 for the other one. The in-between is the 0.77, which is what gets reported in the actual tables of electrode reduction potentials. So each one of these boundaries, right, going from iron 6, you know, with 4 oxygens. Uh, so this is a ferrate. Um, polyatomic anion turning into iron 3. That's your reactant, that's your product. You will have to use your hybrid of reactions to balance this. Four oxygens on the left side, so four waters on the right side. Eight protons on the right side, eight protons on the left side. Overall charge of negative 2 plus 8, which is plus 6 on the left side, and 3 plus on the right side. You have a discrepancy of three electrons, which is why you have three electrons on the left side of your reaction. And I think to be kept in mind is that the balance equations that you derive from the boundaries, right, based on the product on the upper portion and the, you know, and the product on the bottom portion are simply half redox reactions, half, half reductions to be most exact. So each one of those half reductions corresponds to a specific experiment that gives you those particular numbers for the average value of the ducky. So when it comes down to reductions, uh, reduction potentials in particular, Yes, uh, it's all about these shapes. And if you do have multiple potentials, like the one here for iron, they actually appear side to side, like the way you see right here. So this is your typical experiment that you get to um, basically see and observe. All right, so um, same idea for manganese. Each one of these manganese uh, reduction uh, steps takes place based on an actual experiment that goes down to those particular potentials. And so this is all about duckies, right? So <laughs> I couldn't resist, but yes, it's all about those duckies. All right, um, I'll discuss one more thing before we end this video. Let's talk about the diagrams. We, we've talked a little bit about them in the past, but I wanna revisit this idea once more. I said that when you look at the diagrams for the elements, the upper portion is the most oxidized version of the element the bottom portion is the most reduced version of the element. And the boundaries, you simply look at what's on top, that's your reactant, what's on the bottom, that's your product. Uh, so you basically balance the half redox reaction, balance the non-oxygen atoms, non-hydrogen atoms. In this case, all you have is hydrogen, so you just gotta balance the hydrogens. And that gives you overall two plus charge on the left side, overall charge of zero on the right side. So you're missing two electrons, the two electrons need to be on the reactant side. And when you do balance these reactions, the electrons are going to end up on the left side because after all, going from top to bottom implies that you're doing a reduction. Same thing goes for the bottom portion. H2 becomes a reactant. H minus becomes the product. You need to have two H minuses, so you need to have two electrons as well to balance the charges. And each one of these reduction half reactions has its corresponding re, you know, reduction value, potential value which for H plus to H2, that's zero volts. For H2 to hydride, that's negative 2.25 volts. And the, the value for the hydrogen is actually a reference value for most anything else that we do. Um, also, I did mention the metastable species in the red boxes here. They react with each other via a disproportionation reaction that yields the corresponding product on the top of the main diagram and the corresponding product on the bottom portion of the diagram. So from H2O2, you make O2. And from H2O2, you also make water. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna balance all the reactions just to kind of give you some practice. Um, so for the top one, O3 goes to O2. O3 is the reactant, O2 is the product. 
we have to balance the number of oxygens um, for each one of these. So and we're just going to go ahead and write the reactant and product for each one of the steps. So from O2 to water, O2 is the reactant, water is the product. Uh, for H2O2, uh, going uh, to the bottom portion, H2O2 is the reactant, water is the product. Going to the upper portion, we'll have H2O2, H2O2 as the reactant and O2 as the product. All right, so we're going to balance the <clears throat> number of oxygens. You have three oxygens on the left side for O3, so you need to add one water to balance the oxygens. Um, over here, you have uh, O2, so you need to have two waters on the product side. Uh, for H2O2, you have two oxygens on the left side, two oxygens on the right side. Um, H2O2 two going to water, you have uh, two oxygens on the left side, so you need to have two waters on the right side as well. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Now you balance your hydrogens. You have two hydrogens on the left side, on, excuse me, on the right side of the first equation, so you need to add two protons on the left side. You have four hydrogens on the right side of the second equation, so you need to have four H pluses on the left side. Two hydrogens on the left side, two hydrogens on the left side. Um, you need to have two, two H pluses on the right side of the third equation. And for the last one, you have four hydrogens on the right side, so you need to have two hydrogens on the left side of the equation. So we introduce each one of those H pluses, and then we use the charges to figure out the electrons. Overall charge on the left side is two plus, so we need two electrons there. Overall charge on the left side of the second equation is four plus, so we're gonna need four electrons. Overall charge here is two plus on the product side, so we're gonna have to add two electrons on that side. And over here, we have two plus on the left side, so we need to have two electrons on that one. And so notice that the upper portion of the disproportionation is actually an oxidation because the protons, excuse me, the electrons are on the right side of the equation. Okay, same thing for iron, right? For each boundary, we're gonna select the reactant and product as we go from top to bottom. We have four oxygens on the left side. We need four waters on the right side. Now for iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus, there's no oxygens or hydrogen, so you just balance the electrons to get the charge equal on both sides. Iron 2 plus to iron 0 will take up two electrons. So we need to add four waters to the right side. That means that we have eight hydrogens on the right side, none on the left side, so we add eight H pluses. And now we'll look at the charges. Two minus plus eight is plus six. Overall charge here is plus three, so we're missing three electrons. Okay, so we'll stop the video right here, and on the next one, we'll start looking at the cell potential of full reactions.